Choate Rosemary Hall is originally the combination of the school's Choate, established in 1896, which was an all-boys school, and Rosemary Hall, an all-girls school, established in 1890. Uh, they merged together in 1971. They're located in Wallingford, Connecticut, which is about uh, 90 miles away from New York City. Uh, the school itself is about 800 students, two-thirds of which are boarding students, meaning they live on campus, and one-third of which are day students, meaning they commute from the local schools. I'm a day student. Radine is a boarder. A uh, typical class day runs uh, classes from 8 to about 3.20, then sports from 4 to 5.45, and then dinner and studying from 6 till 9.30. Uh, we're also going to do profiles on one another. So, Radin is 18 years old. He was born in Chicago. He's from Bulgaria and lives in Kazakhstan. He plans to major in international affairs in college. He's, he's a prefect of freshman boys, and uh, one of his most impressive accomplishments is that in middle school, he ran 225 miles in 28 days. Um, Ian is also 18 years old, and as he mentioned, he's a day student. He's born and raised in Brantford, Connecticut, which is roughly 40 minutes away from our school. He also plans to major in international relations, and at Choate, he is president of a club that helps mentally disabled people engage in swimming. Ian and I have a lot of experience working together. For the past four years, we have played soccer, basketball, and ultimate frisbee together. In our presentation, Ian will discuss critical treaties that have previously helped reduce the nuclear threat and how they can be used as an example moving forward. We will dive into the primary cause of concern from current nuclear trends, such as weakening treaties. We'll also cover the rise of nationalism and how this affects nuclear relations. Next, we'll explain why the current approach to nuclear disarmament is not enough and what the consequences of not changing our approach could be. Finally, we'll cover what tools are at our disposal for bringing about positive change. So I know we've talked a lot about nuclear treaties already, so I'll try and make this quick. Um, but we're going to be looking at the NPT, the INF, and START. So the NPT has been one of the most effective nuclear treaties. Uh, it, was, it's been, it was enacted as of 1970, and it was established to limit the spread of nuclear weapons. The non-signatories include India, India, Pakistan, Israel, and South Sudan. So I think the INF, personally, has been pretty well covered by all the groups before us. So assuming there's no objections, I think we're just going to move straight to start. START 1 was enacted in 1994, and New START became effective in 2011. Uh, the goal of START is to reduce the uh, arsenals of both Russia and the United States. Um, it's been in the news recently because uh, it appears that both President Trump and President Putin have no uh, intention of extending START past its expiration in 2021. Now we'll cover some of the cause of concern. We find the largest cause of concern to include the recent American withdrawal from critical treaties, the North Korean and Iranian nuclear programs, the border conflict between India and Pakistan, the rise of Chinese power, and the possible deterioration of American and Russian relations. Okay, so recently the U.S. has withdrawn from the INF Treaty, and it appears that it will, in the future, in 2021, it will not extend START. Um, this is a reflection of how both the United States and Russia's relations, especially regarding um, nuclear weapons, has become uh, polarized, similar to that of Cold War times. Now moving on to North Korea's nuclear program. We all know that North Korea's nuclear program poses a severe threat to global security, and in the past two decades, the program has made significant advances, both in testing their nuclear weapons and their modes of delivery. In 2017, they, tested, they successfully tested their first intercontinental ballistic missile, and they claim to have successfully detonated a thermonuclear bomb. Negotiations in early 2018, which have been covered previously in this conference, were mentioned to be promising. However, uh, recent satellite imagery from early 2019 does show activity at possible undeclared nuclear facilities 
and this has harpened the relations between the US and North Korea. Another country whose nuclear program poses a serious threat is Iran. Iran is still a signatory of the NPT and have claimed that their nuclear program has no intention of producing nuclear weapons and that its sole purpose is to generate nuclear power. However, the secrecy of their program has led many to dispute that claim and led to Iran suffering from international sanctions. A worrying aspect of Iran's nuclear program is the heavy amount of support it receives from its international partners, such as China, Pakistan, and most significantly from Russia. Recently, the US has announced that it's going to step away from the Iran deal, which is another worrying aspect. And we personally believe that stopping Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon is important because it could lead to another nuclear arms race in the Middle East between Iran, Saudi Arabia, and possibly Israel. Uh, one group before did an excellent job covering the Pakistan and India conflict. So we would just like to add that both countries have been increasing their military spending, with India increasing it by roughly 7% and Pakistan nearly 20%. We believe that the conflict is further complicated by the international involvement of the US, Russia, and China in the region. So now looking at uh, the rise of China on the global scale, uh, recently China has begun to invest heavily in both its nuclear arsenal and military expansion. Um, Russia and the United States have both been quite wary of this and it seems to be a possible motivating factor for both countries to uh, choose to abandon the INF which China is not hindered by. Um, now with all three of those countries uh, no longer limited by uh, treaties, uh, not that China ever was, um, it will allow for a potential second nuclear arms race. Uh, as I've stated already, uh, the U.S. and Russia relations have begun to weaken after uh, the abandonment of the INF and the potential for uh, leaving START uh, behind. Um, with the potential for a second arms race, including uh, China, the U.S., U the Russia and the United States have returned to similar uh, relations to that of the Cold War. Uh, one of the motiv motivating factors of this polarization that we've looked at was nationalism. Uh, the rhetoric of both President Trump and President Putin has made it clear that both will prioritize their country over the stability of the international system. Uh, that, that kind of uh, logic and way of thinking has allowed for um, both to exit the INF because it hinders their personal country's uh, capabilities of uh, modernizing their nuclear arsenal, even though it may destabilize the international system. Now we will move on to the need for a new approach. We believe that the current nuclear trends are not showing enough positive change with some of the problems being faced, including a slowed rate of denuclearization and in some cases the growth of nuclear arsenals. In 2017, the United Nations held a conference whose goal was to discuss the possible ban on nuclear weapons. None of the Security Council members chose to attend this meeting. This reluctance to discuss even the possibility of a nuclear weapons ban showcases the slowed rate of denuclearization. The chart shows the total number of nuclear weapons in the world by decade. As you can see, during the period of START 1 and START 2, that number significantly decreased with more than 25,000 nuclear weapons being disarmed. In contrast, from 2010 to today, only around 8,000 nuclear weapons have been disarmed. An even more worrying statistic is that several countries have experienced a growth in their nuclear arsenals, taking the direct opposite approach of denuclearization. India and Pakistan have each grown their arsenals by an estimated 10 nuclear weapons, but perhaps the most worrying trend is the growth of the Chinese nuclear arsenal. China, being a major player on the global stage, is risking, as we mentioned, the possibility of a new nuclear arms race by expanding their own arsenal. So some repercussions of uh, these issues would include uh, the potential for a renewed nuclear arms race, uh, the potential for nuclear terrorism, and uh, worst case scenario, the possibility of nuclear destruction. 
So the primary players in a potential renewed nuclear arms race would be Russia, China, and the United States, as these three countries would have the, uh, as the U.S. and Russia already have the largest arsenals, and China is easily capable of uh, enhancing their arsenal very quickly. Another potential threat is nuclear terrorism. According to the Harvard Kennedy School Belfer Center, as of 2010, there have been five terrorist organizations who have had the potential of acquiring and detonating a nuclear weapon. The knowledge for making nuclear weapons is well distributed and can be found on the internet, so the difficult part for terrorist groups becomes acquiring nuclear fissile material. However, the level of security over such material has proven to be insufficient. In 2007, 30 weapons worth of fissile material was stolen from a South African nuclear facility, and furthermore, in 2010, anti-nuclear activists broke into a military base in Belgium, which was housing American nuclear weapons. Solving this issue, we believe, is as simple as increasing the security over fissile material so as to prevent further break-ins and the possibility of terrorist groups acquiring the material. We could also be facing nuclear annihilation in the more conventional sense, war between two nuclear countries. We've already touched upon some of these points, but their importance cannot be understated. If China continues to expand its own arsenal, it could prompt a second nuclear arms race, and all of the hotspots that you see listed could be the site of a nuclear war. Now we'll cover what tools we can use to bring about change. These include treaties, peaceful initiatives in conflict regions, and our main point, economic reallocation. Okay, so when talking about treaties and re-implementation, it's important to recognize that the treaties such as START and uh, the INF were actually quite successful. Uh, in decreasing the nuclear arsenals of both Russia and the United States when they were uh, in effect. So we believe that reinstating a uh, start in 2021 and uh, having the United States and Russia return to the INF would allow for the international system to stabilize. And if it is possible, adding China to the INF might decrease the uh, fear of the U.S. and Russia that China will be able to uh, modernize their nuclear arsenal uh, without being inhibited by any sort of treaty. In terms of regional approaches, we hope to promote a peaceful resolution to the current Kashmir crisis, and we believe that the way forward in the region includes the removal of foreign influence. We also believe that Iran should be prevented from acquiring a nuclear weapon due to the regional ramifications it would pose, such as an arms race with Saudi Arabia. We should look to re-establish ties with Iran and work towards peacefully preventing the acquisition of that nuclear weapon. In North Korea, we hope to continue the peaceful diplomatic initiatives that have been taken to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. Moving on to economic reallocation, we'd like to point out that currently the U.S. plans to invest $50 billion a year in modernizing its own nuclear arsenal. This would this is also furthered by an estimated $450 billion over the next 10 years. We believe that if the critical treaties were re-signed, that the U.S. could look to reinvest that money in other initiatives. Domestically, the U.S. could look to provide Medicare for All, free college, increased food assistance, funding for Planned Parenthood, reducing fossil fuel emissions, and upgrading infrastructure. Internationally, we could look at powers such as Russia, the U.S., and China working together to solve international dilemmas. We furthermore believe that economic reallocation would offer us greater security, and we believe that the United States should pave the way on economic reallocation. We believe that it should be tied into the U.N. Millennium Goals, which Ian will now discuss. So the UN Millennium Goals are these eight initiatives uh, on the screen established by the UN, uh, including eradicating extreme poverty and hunger to achieve universal primary education, promote gender equality, uh, among other goals. The halfway point for these goals was 2015, and significant progress has been made, but further investment is required to uh, complete these eight initiatives. So Josette Sheeran, the founder of en the End Hunger Now program and an a a who has actually previously been here at the Monterey Institute, estimated that $10.3 billion per year was necessary to end world hunger. 
um, whereas in contrast, the total cost to the world economy due to hunger is $260 billion. Uh, Josette Sheeran has already established a network for distributing uh, food and other resources to individuals and organizations in 21 different countries. If the U.S. was to just take a uh, small portion of their nuclear budget and reinvest it into Josette Sheeran's plan to end world hunger, uh, global security might be increased as well as general quality of life. In conclusion, we'd like to highlight that the current trend in the rise of nationalism is responsible for the breaking of important treaties which should instead be saved. The rise of Chinese power could lead to a new arms race if they continue to expand their nuclear arsenal. The world should look to resolve the regional conflicts which also pose a nuclear threat. We believe that the heart of a solution lied in nuclear treaties. If critical treaties are reestablished, then the world can pursue peaceful diplomacy and implement economic reallocation. Real reallocating just a fraction of the funding nuclear weapons receive could solve countless global issues. Such actions would not only improve global security, it would also improve the standards of living of millions of people across the world. All of us gathered here today, just by being present, are already taking steps towards a safer world. And moving forward to solving this global dilemma, we must all remember to keep open minds. Through cooperation and open discussion, we can all together combat this daunting task laid out before us. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Thank you for that great presentation. Given that START will be going out of effect in 2021 and there's been a lot of recent escalations, what do you think is the number one priority that the world and U.S. state policy should focus on regarding uh, nuclear nonproliferation? Um, I mean, I would actually say that uh, within the question, I think the most important thing to focus on is trying to return to the table regarding START in 2021. Uh, START has been successful when it has been implemented, and until 2021 comes rolling around and START is officially off the table, I think it should be prioritized, um, and both sides should attempt to reconsider. Thank you. Um, so you guys claim that uh, as a result from uh, growing nationalism, how this uh, conflict has escalated, would you go as far to say that uh, nationalism is a bad thing in itself? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, I think nationalism is important in just this certain in certain amount of dosage. Um, I think that uh, actually, like, prioritizing your own country's needs is not uh, inherently wrong. I just think that when taken to an extreme level, it turns into a disregard for uh, international needs and international security. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And it's a similar question, but you mentioned about the um, nationalism and um, how can your approach or suggestion about economic um, contributes to weaken the nationalism? Well, um, as for weakening nationalism, we believe that economic reallocation simply shows that in our minds we're putting funding away from our own country and into a global issue that's affecting millions of people across the world. It's, it's, like, it's not really a selfish opinion to do that, so we think that just by doing that economic reallocation, you're kind of acting against nationalism because you're spending that money elsewhere rather than in your own country. Okay, thank you.